What does a pharmacist do? Well, most people might answer that a pharmacist dispenses the medications that my doctor prescribes. Now, I work with a ton of great pharmacists, and one thing that I don't generally see is excitement about pills in a vial. And this is probably because pharmacists have been trained to do so much more. So what can you get excited about in your community? To find out, let's go Beyond the Scripts. Hey, welcome back to Beyond the Scripts. I'm your host, Will Tuft with Pioneer Rx. And today we have a special guest joining us from Norland Pharmacy. Now, there are a couple acronyms that you hear repeatedly um, on on this podcast and really, I guess, on any pharmacy podcast. But you're going to hear probably CPESN and and FTP only – I think the only uh, acronym you may hear more than those is DIR. (laughs) Um, So – Really excited to have a rock star pharmacy from the CPESN group uh, joining us today. So uh, kind of a new face, somebody that uh, may not be on everybody's radar. Ashley Yoder, thanks for joining us so much. Uh, but a, a an up and coming rock star in the uh, in the pharmacy world. Wow, that's so kind. Um, yeah, <laughs> we have just kind of hit the ground running with Flip the Pharmacy and CPES, and I am definitely new to the game, just graduated in 2020. So um, we are just now kind of getting past all of the COVID hoopla with the vaccines and uh, monoclonal antibodies and stuff like that. So we are definitely trying to move forward with some of our clinical services, which has been so fun. Yeah, what an exciting time to enter the uh, enter the field. So um, tell me a little bit uh, about Norland Pharmacy. Give me kind of the, the elevator pitch, uh, you know, about the, uh, the the pharmacy you call home. Yeah, absolutely. So we are Norland Avenue Pharmacy in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. The pharmacy has been around for 21 years and is owned and operated by Dr. Wayne Myers, who is just an awesome boss to have. He Um, started the pharmacy 21 years ago, which is also the year he got married. So it's been him and his family as a team running the pharmacy. Um, We are an independent located in a medical office building and do a lot of different services. We offer uh, compounding. We do vaccinations. We just got into COVID testing. Um, I'm the clinical services pharmacist there. So anything clinical services related. That's all me. Um, We're doing a lot of med sync. So definitely a lot of different things going on. Um, And like I said, now that we're getting past all the COVID stuff, we're having an opportunity to help grow different ends of the business. So um, yeah, that's that's where we're at. I love working there. We have a really awesome team that really cares for their patients. So it's been really fun to start my career there. And yeah, I just love it so far. Awesome. Yeah. So uh, when I started looking up uh, the Norland uh, Avenue Pharmacy, I I saw a lot of really neat kind of, um, I don't know, like a a really neat kind of behind the scenes look at your team uh, through social media, through the website. I saw some really great videos, even from Dr. Wayne within his own home, um, you know, sharing, uh, I don't know, some of the, I I guess, values of your business with the community. and I thought that was really neat. So tell me a little bit about the team there because there's a lot going on. You mentioned that it's definitely a family-run business. Um, dive into that a little bit more. Yeah. So um, I would say we have, I don't know the exact number, but probably 40 to 50 employees. So we are, I guess, a little bit more of a, a larger independent. There are four pharmacists that are currently working there now. Um, and what I love about it is that one of our core values is that we're family oriented. So that involves just, you know, treating our entire team as a family and, um, making sure that everybody has a voice, no matter what position they're working at, everyone um, can voice ideas. So, um, I'll even say like one of our, uh, technicians actually came up with an idea that changed our entire med sync process. And that has made it into something that has been really um, cool and works really well. So I think that that's been something valuable is that um, we really do um, cherish our family oriented aspect and that um, I really feel like our pharmacy together acts like a family and we care for one another. Um, So that has been obviously really nice to work for a company like that. And then also kind of like you had mentioned, we have a very loyal and a very great patient base. And so that's where 
Um, Dr. Wayne has uh, created some really good relationships in the community and those videos where he's at home making recommendations or whether we're in the store making recommendations, I think it helps that um, we're trusted members of the community where people come to us for advice and trust us with our recommendations. I saw a lot of videos that were, you know, kind of focused on on pharmacy, uh, focused on the the front end business. Uh, I, I thought some of the the ones that were really neat were more like uh, kind of the faith based videos that you guys were just really sharing, you know, um, that aspect with the community. And I th I think you know that's not something every pharmacy is going to do or want to do or or feel strongly about. But I did think that that's. Um, kind of a unique part of uh, the culture there, it would seem like, that definitely uh, comes a comes across authentically on, on social media. And I thought that was really cool. Yeah, yeah, that's a, a big part of our pharmacy, which I think sets us apart from other places is that we are um, God centered. We um, actually just started uh, doing Facebook lives of our morning prayers where we just pray for our patients and pray for our day. Um, and we'll accept prayer requests from um, any of the public that comment on our Facebook posts. So that's helped with some of our engagement, but just connecting with the community in that aspect. And then something that will actually really drew me uh, to Norland too, is that um, they really encourage people to grow in their individual face. And so um, we have monthly staff meetings that involve a pastor coming in and doing a devotional with us, uh, showing us how we can grow um, personally and implement different aspects of that um, into our day to day. So I think that has been something that's really cool and was unique and what uh, drew me to intern and then start at Norland um, altogether. Yeah, I think any anytime you have a group of people who finds a bigger why, um, you know, than than a report at the end of the day, uh, it, it's definitely going to have you know, a, a different focus on the way they do everything, right? Their their patient care. And, and you know, that, that may not just be like a faith-based thing, but, you know, if you have a company who's, uh, you know, kind of building like financial training, like, the, you know, we, we've implemented like a Dave Ramsey uh, access here, you know, th those bigger whys uh, that, that help personal and professional development, I think, are, are really cool. So it was neat to see that online. And I know that's definitely not going to be everybody's cup of tea, you know, um, but it's it's very neat that um, that you guys have embraced that and, and share that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So tell me a little bit about how Ashley ended up at Norland Avenue Pharmacy, because um, you said you've only been out of uh, school for a couple of years. So was that a... Um, you know, a, a local uh, kind of hotspot for you? Was that some place that you were able to actually, um, you know, uh, do do some of your um, rotations with? Or, or how did you end up in that location? Yeah, so uh, kind of a funny story. I had uh, met Wayne uh, a couple years ago when I was very early into pharmacy school through, um, it was my future father-in-law at that time, um, lived near the pharmacy and knew of Wayne from church. And so I um, was always interested in independent pharmacy. That's where I first got my job when I was in high school, just working as a cashier uh, technician in an independent pharmacy. So I knew that that was the route I was leaning towards. So I went to Norland and shadowed there just for a couple hours one day. And then later when I was doing appy rotations, um, Wayne has, had accepted me on as a student. So I was able to spend uh, five weeks there and uh, meet all of the people. Um, and I worked very closely with the clinical services pharmacist there at the time, who was just a very valuable, awesome mentor to me. She was the um, pharmacist there before me. And actually, it just worked out timing wise that she was retiring the same year I was graduating. And so there was, um, you know, just a really nice transition transition process there where I felt like I had fit with the team really well and really enjoyed what she was doing there with clinical services. So when I graduated, it just was kind of a natural transition into the pharmacist role there. Nice. Very cool. Um, so before that rotation, did you kind of have that clinical focus? Did you have a desire to go into that specific area? Was that something that that you saw as, as really the future of pharmacy or is that just kind of what you know, what they, they needed uh, uh, somebody to carry the torch in, and, and that's how you ended up. 
No, I, I always knew I wanted to have a clinical focus. So before I was looking into independent, I had looked into long-term care pharmacy and Amcare pharmacy, which is just inherently more clinical. Um, but I really enjoyed that aspect just with uh, a lot of the, the science behind that and making recommendations and being more of a provider versus just someone behind the counter. Um, so that's, mm. you know, where I was very specific in that I wanted community pharmacy. I wanted to have that accessibility in the community to reach out to a variety of different people, but um, not be in a so much of a chain setting where I didn't have the opportunity to connect with them on a more clinical level. So it just kind of mashed all of my interests together and ended up being kind of like my dream role um, right off the bat at a pharmacy school for me, which I feel very lucky. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So, um, was there like a specific area that that you felt really strongly about? I know, um, you know, occasionally we'll run into a, a, a somebody who's been affected by somebody in their life with you know a, a chronic disease state, and and they feel really strongly about being able to help what they've seen and help what they've learned, you know, from from that personal experience and take that into the community. So what was there like a kind of a catalyst or or a specific focus for where you wanted to uh you know kind of kind of drive your career? Yeah, so I think it's changed over time. I think um any type of clinical service where I'm providing patient education, I really enjoy that teaching aspect. That's something that um has just been a passion of mine, but Specifically, I have some uh, family that has had uh, diabetes and just a lot of people in the community as we were kind of growing our MedSync program, seeing people that have diabetes. Um, that became a focus for me all of 2021. We got accredited for uh, through D, uh, DSMES to provide diabetes education services. And um, that has just been something that I've taken on that I find so fun and I'm very passionate about is um, just providing those group classes to patients to help them control their diabetes better. So I would say that's the disease state that we focused on in 2021. And then this year, we're doing uh, mental cognition screenings with the Cognivu device, um, mm -hmm. which we just got. So that is turning into a different passion. So I feel like it's changing. But anything where there's patient education aspect to it, I am all in. I love doing all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. So um, the diabetes boot camp is actually something that I was able to find some information in uh, on online. And I thought that was really neat that you guys are kind of, you know, focusing on that, focusing, uh, you know, that disease state that was really affecting a lot of people, but can be mitigated so greatly just by lifestyle changes, by coaching and by education. Uh, it, it's amazing that we don't see more of a focus on that nationwide. Um, but tell me a little bit about how that launched, how that works, and you know, also how that works uh, as, as a business owner. Yeah, for sure. So um, we first thought of the idea randomly. One of our pharmacists uh, had listened to a webinar about uh, DSMES services, and the pharmacist had diabetes himself and thought it was really cool um, what the services could provide. And so he shared that with me. And then I was able to connect with our state organization, Pennsylvania Pharmacists Association, and found out that they actually offered a um, year-long course with a grant involved to help with payment for it, where we could uh, train to be uh, ADCES accredited. I know I'm using like a ton of acronyms, but it's just the one um, one of the accrediting organizations that give you a certificate saying that you've done this training and are equipped to be able to offer this type of service. But uh, PPA walked us through every single step and it took us a full year. It's a lot of different training, a lot of different paperwork that you have to have um, on file, but a lot of good work to help us be prepared to offer the service in a way that's actually going to help people, that's going to make business sense, um, and that you know we're, we're going to able, be able to do well. So after that whole accreditation process, right now what we're doing is offering it as a diabetes boot camp, like you said, where it's a group class. Um, this is only the second time in May is going to be the second time we're offering the course and we're doing four weekly classes focused on a different type of lifestyle management. So whether that's nutrition, exercise or monitoring, medication management, um, we're doing a whole diabetes patho review um, just so people understand what's happening to their body. So um, breaking that down into a weekly class. And we are having patients um, 
pay out of pocket right now for that class. But one of the big drives business wise is that um, it's Medicare billable. So we're looking in the future uh, to target Medicare patients and to try and bill medically for that something new to the pharmacy world. So I've been doing a lot of research to try and get that up and running. But um, I'm hoping for our next class in the fall, we're going to be able to bill for it, which will bring in some profit. Nice. Nice. So yeah, a lot of, I mean, man, a lot to unpack there because there's so many areas that we could talk for an hour about, you know? Um, so let, let's start with a, you know, when, when you're offering those trainings on disease state like that, um, you know, you, I imagine you go through pharmacy school and it's a very clinical, um, you know, scientific study of this is what's happening biologically. Um, you know, how much do you learn from your patients when they come in and say, hey, this is how it affects me practically? And and how much has that changed kind of your focus and 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 guided um you know the the direction of your care and the direction of your training? Yeah. So I feel like the the patient stories and and then talking about what's actually happening to their body is what is driving our education in the boot camp altogether. I mean, no one wants me to stand up there in front of a group of people and talk about the, you know, nitty gritty science facts of it all. We uh, go through one uh, little story to help them understand what's happening to their body. But the purpose of it is really to have um, a group of people supporting each other that can then share what's actually happening in their own life, happening to their body. They can ask questions um, and we can go from there. But I think having that class and that type of education be more um, patient focused. And I mean, we call it diabetes boot camp for a reason. I want it to be practical advice that people can take home and implement and not just a lot of uh, sciencey fluff that we're giving them information. So um, I think, yeah, that's that's very different from school where obviously we're trying to learn the nitty gritty of the science, but it's been a lot more fun for me to be able to help um, people in the community that actually have that disease state understand it um, in a way that makes sense to them. And then they're able to use that information to apply it to different areas of their life. Yeah. And what's funny is, you know, you, you refer to that as like a, a clinical service and clinical care and, and clinical is synonymous with, um, you know, not personal traditionally, like it, you could use that to describe, you know, an experience at a, if a car sales, uh, like, you know, like a retail experience that was impersonal might be described as clinical, which is kind of funny how that term could be used. And, and, and what you're saying is just the opposite. It's such a, you know, hands-on personal connection, um, you know, that I, I think that that goes against what a, a lot of people may have that preconceived notion of doing clinical care is. It, it's really, you know, just just the opposite of that, that, uh, that hands-off approach. So, yeah, for sure. And that's how we get people. I mean, we have the patient at the center of any type of clinical service that we do. If we didn't, I don't think anyone would sign up for the boot camp. But because we have, I mean, we have, you know, the boot camp has been full for both both of our sessions so far, which has been really awesome. But I think it's just word of mouth of, you know, people learning about what it is and people that have been in the boot camp and they realize that this isn't just someone that's getting up in and talking to them for an hour. You know, me, someone that doesn't even have diabetes, that's an, a new pharmacist like that. I feel like some of that disconnect could be there, but um, because it's it's focused on the patient and them making relationships with themselves, that I think um, has helped draw people in, which has been cool. A couple things related to the billing side of that. Um, one, you mentioned you know there's grant opportunities, uh, so I, I think that's obviously a you know an exciting kind of foreshadowing of what's coming. You know, people see that there's value in that preventative care. Um, I mean, the whole Part D plan is centered around that same mindset, but somehow education was left off and medication was covered. Um, but then also, if there's value there, if, if you can change people's quality of life, I think they're more than willing to pay for that. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, at the end of the day, some of the things that we're doing are potentially keeping people out of the hospital. So I think that's very much justification in itself to be able to bill for a service that's preventing long-term consequences that could even be more costly to an insurance company. Yeah. So um, how do you how do you fit that in at, at the pharmacy? So, 
you know, you've already got um, a lot going on. You've you've got a large uh, retail front end, you, you know, really neat boutique OTC area. You guys are doing compounding, immunizations. Uh, you're doing a lot. You mentioned you have a large team, but how do you how do you really coordinate all of that? I know the appointment based model has to has to accommodate that that level of care, but uh, you know how how did you guys approach that? Yeah, I think with just clinical services in general, um, having someone like me that is specifically focused on clinical services, I'm giving specific time during the week to just focus on those types of services um, and then specific block time, you know, to offer them to patients and offer the classes. So we have different pharmacists that have taken on different roles in different sectors to be able to focus on that one thing to do it well. So we have a pharmacy team leader that's focused on workflow management and making sure that's the most efficient uh, that it can be and that everything is going well there. We have a compounding pharmacy manager and that's uh, Wayne himself, but he does everything with the lab, making sure everything with that is going well. So I think um, kind of dividing those roles and having different pharmacists take over different uh, responsibilities. Um, and then we meet once a week to come together to share what we're learning in our different aspects and how we can um, share ideas and, and make different things better. So I think that that has been a good approach is just having um, enough staff and a pharmacist to give each of us the time to do what we need to do in our roles, but then having that time where we come together once a week uh, to share different things that are that are happening to make each of those sectors better has been what's made it work so far for sure. Gotcha. So um, kind of a two-part question. You you mentioned uh, that somebody had an improvement to your MedSync program earlier. Um, so definitely want to know what that is and how that fit in. But then also, you know, how do you identify these opportunities? So if you have a patient um, that maybe, you know, gets a, a new, um, you know, uh, chronic disease state medication on their profile, you know, is that something that you guys recognize at MedSync and then, you know, trigger that kind of clinical follow-up or what? what's the workflow for making sure that you're offering that care? Yeah. So I think to answer your question, we just kind of have to go down the journey of the MedSync. That has been um, pretty much, like I said, a journey. We have tried out um, probably three or four different MedSync uh, protocols, procedures throughout a year's time. And a lot of different things didn't work where we weren't able to provide that level of care um, with looking at kind of disease state management where we were behind, uh, where we weren't growing our SYNC program, where our uh, technicians were really stressed. Um, so I think um, I think that could be helpful, I guess, to just go through what that looked like for us and where we are uh, now, which is a completely uh, different spot. We've actually reached 50% prescription volume with sync, which oh, wow. has been a goal for a long, long time. Um, and I think the new the new program that we have um, has allowed us to do that. So I can kind of talk through, I guess, a little bit of what that looked like before and what it looks like now. Um, if that would be, yeah, yeah. So, tell me what didn't work and then tell me, yeah. <laughs> tell, tell me how you fixed it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I mean, I think part of it comes to is that I am newer. So I'm just like, thank goodness I have a really uh, forgiving team that has allowed me to just, just try a lot of different things. And, um, so I would say the first, the first, uh, thing that we had, whenever I came into the clinical services role, we had one technician that was managing the entire sync program which was fine because we had enough patients that she could um, that she could manage herself, but we wanted to grow to get to 50%. So as we grew our patient base, we found out quickly that one person was not enough to manage all of these new people that we were adding to sync. So we ended up adding two more technicians and we had three uh, sync technicians that we split all of our sync patients into thirds and they would manage those patients, We, um, which was going okay. But again, because the health coaches were managing their own specific subset of patients, that added a little bit of stress to regular workflow because if that person wasn't there during the day or if they were off and that patient yeah. had a question, nobody else in the pharmacy knew anything about that person. That one technician knew everything about them. 
um, and nobody else knew anything. So that created a little bit of um, tension there with uh, efficiency and being able to, to help the patient when needed. Um, but then we ended up having some staffing changes, which ended up with us only having two sync technicians in um, our sync program, and they split their patients in half. And that is really when we, I would say, hit the rock bottom of sync because uh, we had a lot of patients and we had two sync technicians who knew their patients forwards and backwards, which had benefits. I mean, we, uh, those sync technicians created very valuable relationships with, with their patients. Uh, they were the only technicians in the pharmacy, the only people that were talking to those specific subset of people. They were learning things about them that um, otherwise we may not have learned because they were talking to the same people every mm-hmm. month, creating those relationships. So with that aspect, we liked it. I mean, we liked that we were growing relationships with our patients, but uh, there was a, a large amount of burnout among the two sync technicians because, like I said, like they couldn't feel like they could take off. They couldn't feel like they could take a vacation um, because when they did, they knew that if something happened with one of their patients, which at this point we're going to, you know, they're they're having 400 patients that are their own, so that's a lot of people to have for one person to manage, and then if you know, one of those 400 people have a question the day that they're not there, which is likely because that's a lot of people, we wouldn't know what to do. We'd have to contact them on their day off. Um, and they just wouldn't feel like they would be able to, uh, to take yeah. any time off. But and- there, there's only so many notes. There's only so much room, I guess, in the sync notes to really give that full picture. I mean, you, you can document and document, but I, I guess, you know, I can, I can see where, where there, that's not very scalable to have that level of, uh, of, of care. Yeah. And the way that the workflow model worked, I mean, for sure, the sync notes were were helpful, but we had a workflow model where if someone called and it was that person's sync person, nobody else in the pharmacy was allowed to take that call. Like we went Ah, to that, that, that's where the issue came is because we wanted that specific person to have that relationship. But that's, yeah, that's where there was some disconnect there. And then um, we saw our accuracy and our efficiency, um, suffer because of that too, because it was a lot of patients they were trying to take on for two people that were only part-time in the, the sync role. Um, Mm -hmm. yeah, we were for sure having a lot of, um, issues as you can imagine. So that is what didn't work. Um, (laughs) as you can kind of hear from lacking efficiency, accuracy, all that kind of stuff. But, uh, luckily one of our other, uh, she was actually one of our workflow technicians, but she is just someone that has really awesome ideas. Um, she came in and said, Hey, what if you didn't have, uh, each health coach have separate patients? What if you incorporated two more part-time health coaches, which we're now, you know, I'm now using different terminology. We're calling them health coaches, kind of separating them even more, giving them kind of a different clinical title. We have, uh, she said, why don't we do those two people? They're the two main health coaches, but then we have two backup health coaches that can answer questions if they're not there. And instead of having our patients split, all of the patients are going to be together and each day they're going to split the patients in half. So maybe, you know, maybe the one, one of our girls isn't talking to the same person every single month, but there's still only a group of four people that are talking to that patient. So there still is relationship building there, but there's, uh, we're able to improve our efficiency, accuracy, all of that. And ever since we switched to that system, it has been just a complete game changer. We've been able to add patients without uh, compromising accuracy and efficiency. Um, and that, yeah, that I feel like that model so far has been working out the best that we've had. had. Yeah, yeah, definitely seems like that would make that a little bit more flexible. Um, so it, I guess everybody in that case also kind of has the, the same playbook on, all right, here's what to do when we see this, right? If there's, you know, a new a new medication added, how, you know, is there a specific protocol to make sure that those patients are invited to the boot camp or, you know, somebody's going to take that patient aside and, and go over the opioid pledge, right? Like, like, how do you handle those situations to make sure that it's consistently followed through? Yeah. So notes are a big thing for us, having notes and the critical comments, having notes in the sync comments. So, um, 
for example, we're part of CPSN's uh, UPMC asthma program. So anytime um, we have one of those eligible patients that's also a sync patient, I will put in the sync notes for um, that person to do the asthma questionnaire with them. So we're not repeating service, but we're providing our med sync call and then offering um, the UPMC asthma service so that I can send off the e-care plan for that. Or if there's someone that needs an opioid pledge, uh, that is something that's more down to our will call end. So maybe we're putting a point of sale comment in saying when this person picks up their medication, make sure you review the opioid pledge with them. So it's uh, making notes at, you know, for whoever is going to be the best person to accomplish that job that I think that's helped us. Um, yeah, helped us with that for sure. So Tell me a little bit about the opioid pledge. If somebody is listening and they're like, opioid pledge, it sounds like just a kind of a standardized thing the way we, you named it. Uh, but maybe that's something that not every pharmacy is currently doing. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So the opioid pledge was part of a flip the pharmacy change package. So um, we can talk a little bit more about that too. But with the um, change package with Flip the Pharmacy, they would give us a breakdown of what that month's focus was going to be on and different tasks that we could do um, to make the pharmacy more clinically focused. So one of those was to create an opioid pledge. And that basically means that it has um, some different bullet points that show what the pharmacy is responsible for and then also what the patient is responsible for. So it's uh, laying out for the patient that uh, if they're picking up an opioid medication, and this is for chronic opioid management. So if we see if someone's getting a 30-day supply and they've gotten, I would say, one or two fills of a 30-day supply, that's when we're giving them the pledge. And that's outlining that uh, the pharmacy is responsible for checking the PDMP. The pharmacy is responsible for making sure that the dosing is appropriate, um, that everything on the prescription is legally correct. And then it's uh, saying uh, exactly what we ex are expecting of our patients. So uh, we're saying patients are responsible for keeping their medications from getting lost or stolen. They're responsible for not asking for their fill more than three days early. That's our, our cutoff. Um, they're responsible for getting all of their controlled medications at one pharmacy. Um, so we have, I, I would say, maybe 10 different bullet points that we have them read, and then they sign the pledge, and then they also sign whether or not they have a Narcan. And if they do not, we will always recommend to fill a Narcan, Narcan on the spot for them. Um, then oh, wow. we, yeah, we'll take that e-care plan. We will, uh, scan it into the patient's documents and then, or take the opioid pledge, scan it into the patient's documents. And then I'll send an e-care plan off to CPESN documenting that we did the opioid education and that we offered Narcan. Um, so there's, it sounds a, like a lot, but it really doesn't take that much time. We've kind of gotten to uh, a groove of doing it and everyone has just been able to kind of incorporate that into workflow now, but um, it's something that we do that I think protects both us and the and the patients. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I saw Joe Moose speak about this um, at NCPA this year, um, I guess back in October. And I thought it was really, really neat, uh, you know, just how detailed that documentation that, you know, they were using a care plan um, for, for that documentation and, and documenting not only what they dispensed for reporting purposes, but documenting what they didn't dispense and and you know how how they had taken those mitigation efforts, um, but I think when you when you put that extra emphasis on those high risk prescriptions like that, you're also you know creating a an atmosphere for your patients where they know you care, they know that you take this seriously, and also you know where um, any anybody uh, who maybe is a bit you know. Uh, nefariously filling prescriptions, you know, knows that that's not going to fly at, at at your pharmacy, and, and it's also well documented that again, you're also covered, um, you know, in, in the event of an audit or anything like that. So, I, I think that's pr pretty. Uh, I think that's pretty smart. It seems like every pharmacy should be doing that at this point. Yeah, I mean, we, I, I think so too. I think, like I said, it just provides that extra layer of protection and lines out clearly what the expectations are because the patient isn't going to know unless you tell them. And the fact that they're actually signing a document that says that they understand what those are, that's something that we have referred back to with patients, um, especially patients that are trying to fill up multiple pharmacies. We can say, no, you signed this document that said that you're going to fill everything here. And that's how we can protect and make sure you're filling, you know, the right medications at the right time. 
Um, so we've definitely been able to utilize that. Um, I wouldn't say as like leverage, but as, as something that we can show back to our patients if it's broken. Yeah. Yeah. And for sure. You know, it's, it, it's kind of funny now. Like I think of, you know, somebody who's been in pharmacy for a long time, um, you know, I, it just kind of reminds me of that movie. Like there's no country for old men where, you know, and, and the, the past five years, the, uh, just the landscape of, you know, COVID and the, uh, opioid epidemic. I mean, uh, low reimbursements, man, it is a, uh, difficult time. And I like it, it, it's kind of a crazy time, uh, for pharmacy. So, um, yeah, that, that's interesting. And, and it's also interesting. I think that like, you know, if you do have somebody getting a normal opioid prescription for like a surgery or something like that, and you know, who's, who's maybe not in tune with, you know, that, the side effects of that, um, just a couple of years ago, it seems like we were, you know, not as cautious as we should have been. Yeah, I, I think for sure. Now, with, with those patients, we don't make them sign a, a pledge right off the bat unless they're started on chronic therapy. But they're always patients that we uh, will verbally counsel just because of the side effects, especially if we see someone's new to opioid therapy. Definitely the do not drive, try and avoid alcohol. Like if you're going to take this, go home and take it and see how your body reacts. Be careful of taking it scheduled and long term. So just I think that verbal counseling there that they may or may not have gotten from their doctor's office is so important in trying to prevent that long-term use. Yeah, for sure. How, how's the, the Narcan prescription work? Do you guys, um, is that a cash pay or, or is that a, a zero, zero pay for the patient? How does that work? Uh, different patient to patient. So we have a standing order prescription that we can use. So if someone wants one, we can um, just write up the prescription ourselves as a, a verbal script with the um, whoever has the standing order as the doc. And then we can bill insurance. Uh, sometimes there is a copay, sometimes there isn't, or they can pay out of pocket. But I would say as long as there's not a copay or not a high copay, the patient will accept it. 99% of our refusals are because the insurance companies aren't covering it to where it's going to be affordable for the patient. Wow. Yeah. Which is sad. Yeah, for sure. Uh, def definitely something that seems like in 2022 would be, um, you know, something that uh, we're, you know, more, more cautious with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So when I was looking um, around the website, I saw, you know, all the enhanced services that you guys offer, the MedSync, um, you know, all the classes that you offer. Um, I also saw some things that I thought were really interesting. When you go to a, um, a, a lot of pharmacy websites, they have like a news section um, and that's just, you know, populated with an RSS feed or an event section and, and the events are maybe, you know, from six, eight, 12 months ago. Uh, everything was very current on your site. Um, and uh, I also noticed that you guys have a newsletter that you mail out. And so when I looked at that, I was I was uh, clicking around and I was like, okay, well, let me see where they get this feed from. Um, and it is very much not a pre-populated newsletter. That looks like something that your team spends a lot of time on um, and has a lot of great information on it that you're able to, I'm assuming, get electronically. But it also looks like that's formatted to actually print and mail out and interact with your patients where they live, um, which is no small initiative. So tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so I can easily single out one person because we have <laughs> Ken, who is our marketing director, who does the whole thing every single month. Now she'll yeah. get ideas and, and different um, information from other people. So like the diabetes boot camp article, I end up I ended up writing that one, um, and other people will provide some input. But she has just been. Um, priceless as someone that's been able to do that every single month and get that out to our patients and just does an awesome job with featuring. Um, we'll feature new products, we'll feature new services, um, have a lot of really good uh, information there. A lot of times we'll talk about different compounded products, um, but that uh, we offer, like you said, electronically, but we also have a really large mailing list where we will uh, mail it out to all of those people. And then we have paper copies in the store for people. Um, 
to uh, just kind of pick up and read. But that is some that is a marketing tool that I feel like has been really valuable for us because people all the time will come in with the newsletter in hand or call in and say, hey, I saw this product focused in your newsletter. Um, are you still selling, selling the supplement? Can I pick one up? Or, hey, I saw the diabetes boot camp in the newsletter. That's um, been a really cool marketing tool for us and a really cool way for us to connect with the community. But yeah, we have we are very lucky to have one person that is doing all of that every month. Yeah. Is she doing all the actual typesetting on that as well? Or do you guys outsource that? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That was, uh, that was one of my, my jobs in, uh, in college. I worked at a local print shop and I, I spent a lot of time doing a lot of newsletters. <laughs> and so there's a lot that goes into that. Yeah. Especially if you're generating all of that content. Um, yeah. So, so kudos on that. Um, also, you know, how does that work? Um, you know, how does that fit into your marketing plan? Is that something that um, you guys work with an outside uh, group like GRX or is that something that, you know, you guys have just always done and so we keep doing it? What What's the focus there? Yeah. So the, the newsletter is something that to my knowledge, we, you know, have done for a really long time when I came on that wasn't anything new for us to offer, but yeah, that's something that's part of part of our marketing plan. Um, in terms of any other marketing, if we're focusing on a specific product or a specific service, then um, we'll do marketing specific to that. So like I said, we're offering the new cognition screenings. We're talking about doing newspaper articles or a billboard, or we just started doing the strip packaging for medications and we're um, advertising that with, uh, I think we're trying to get a billboard set up for that. So we do a lot of uh, different things. She does a lot of different things to help uh, reach the community in different in different ways in the new newsletter is is one of those things that's helpful for us. Yeah. So any anybody out there listening, I, I think it's definitely worth going to the Norland Avenue Pharmacy website. And there's a section where you can go look at those newsletters. And like I said, I, I thought there's a lot of really good content in there. So definitely recommend everyone go and uh, maybe get some ideas from 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 that site. That's what this podcast is all about, just stealing great ideas. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, thanks. I actually just listened to the podcast um, you guys did. Um, I forget his name, uh, but he was the one that does all the TikToks. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. TikTok yeah, Phil. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I was thinking, yeah, thinking about that the other day, too. It's like, oh, so could we do a TikTok? But yeah, it definitely has been really cool to get some different ideas from this po podcast. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, that was one of the things I found in um, during the COVID pandemic, like going to any news source would be so slanted one way or the other. Um, it, it's insane how political um, everything is, you know. Um, and, and so there's, you know, just fear tactics and, and it, it would look very grim or, or very vague. Or um, So I found that, you know, anytime I saw a new headline, there were a couple pharmacy uh, Facebook uh, pages that I would go to, you know, uh, Jen up over at uh, Flatirons in uh, Longmont, Colorado was one that I would go to anytime I saw like a new guideline come out. Uh, there, there are a handful of pharmacies that I would go to and just get their personal take on it. Um, you know, it's it's so easy to to have that connection with your patients now. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, you mentioned the Cognivue, um test, and and I know that mental health is another thing that kind of came up a lot through the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So are you focusing mainly on the memory decline and and kind of dementia aspects? Are you looking at, you know, PHQ-9 and GAD-7s and, and other kind of mental health uh, tests? Or, you know, is that something that you're just kind of dabbling in? Where do you see that? Yeah, so I think that having a focus on mental health would be something that's really cool. I would say right now we're just very, very new to the whole cognition world. So what we're focusing on now is um, the memory decline. We're focusing on learning about different supplements that can help with um, improving cognition. I think it's something um, that we're finding very relevant because uh, loss of cognition could be a side effect of long COVID. So we're doing a lot of different um, research into that, but we're finding that there's a lot of different avenues where we can um, offer the mental cognition screening and where it could be helpful for people. So um, even looking at different schools and doing um, testing kids that are about to go into contact sports. So if they have a concussion, we can test them again and see if there's any 
type of cognition decline. If someone is starting a new uh, cognition supplement, like a Prevagen or a Sharp Thought or something like that, we can see, you know, if they do a baseline test and then a test again in six months, we can see if that supplement did anything. So I like that it's giving us some hard numbers uh, to be able to show if uh, cognition is improving or declining. Yeah, that's probably like the the most – I don't know. I, I, I guess everybody is um, – you know, the, our bodies are going to to fail. There's disease states. There's getting older. There's things that you know inevitably we're we're going to work through. But uh, the loss of cognition is just probably one of the scariest. So it is really exciting. Anything to to combat that? Yeah, yeah. Part of it too is we found like a study. I think it was Alzheimer's researcher from one of those sites, and they found that loss of cognition and memory decline was one of the most feared disease states over other chronic disease states like hypertension or diabetes, things like that. Um, that's one of the most feared. And I think a lot of it is because people just don't know that there's there are things that can be done to help improve cognition, whether that's a supplement, whether that's doing different memory uh, cognition helping apps or exercise or different things like that. But yeah, our, that's kind of the focus with our, our clinical services this year is getting that up and running and showing people that there is something that can be done. Yeah. So uh, we're kind of winding down on the hour. I want to hear what you think is going to be important in, you know, two years and five years and 10 years uh, in the clinical space. Yeah. So I think the biggest thing that we can do uh, as as pharmacies right now is just eating up any opportunity that is given to us to offer any type of clinical intervention and bill for that. So anytime that CPESN comes out with an opportunity, whether that's doing CMRs for a different entrance or doing like what we're doing, the UPMC asthma combination um opportunity where we're able to bill and get payment for uh, asking uh, patients about their asthma treatment. I would say it's just noticing when those opportunities are there and getting involved in them so that um, these companies like CPSN and PPA and all the different state organizations can get the data that they need to go to different insurance plans um, to show the value of pharmacists. Because I think that uh, we are moving more from a fee for product to fee for service, and we're going to have to have to put our foot in the door there and, and try and get payment for a lot of the different interventions that we're offering. Yeah, I, I think that's, you know, a, a conversation so many pharmacists have had lately is, you know, how do we get paid for what we do outside of dispensing? And, you know, you have to work as a group to to kind of create those standards that that allow billing to, to be practical. So, um, you know, you mentioned the diabetes uh, boot camp and, and, and billing for the diabetic training. You know, what's the mechanism that you're looking at there? Yeah, so that has been a, a little bit harder just because that's just kind of straight up. You're trying to trying to build Medicare for that. So what we had to do is switch around our PTAN, and now we're having to get all the necessary documentation um, and figure out the best platform to use uh, to document our service, and then we can build from there. But I know it's something that other pharmacies are doing and that doctors' offices are doing. So um, we that is that is kind of the next step is is billing for that. Right. And so it sounds like maybe more of a traditional EHR transmission for for that service. Yeah. Yeah. But then um, you mentioned, you know, it, it sounds like a lot of the other things that you're billing with through CPESN, you're actually able to do directly from your pharmacy software using the care goals and working with CPESN. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that has made it really easy and very doable. That's why I feel like everybody should get involved with that is because once I do the like the asthma intervention, all I have to do is type up my e-care plan, make sure I have the right SNOMED codes, and then I send it off to CPSN asthma program. And then that's they process it and then we get our payments in each month. But that has been something that has been very doable, a way to get our foot in the door of, of the medical billing side. Yeah, that's so exciting to see it happening, you know, with, within your own space, without, you know, the the workaround, without an EHR, without, yeah. you know, sharing, you know, uh, sharing, profit sharing with a prescriber. So super exciting stuff. Actually looking forward to um, Cody Clifton talking about some of that at Connect uh, this oh, for summer. Oh, sure. Yep, I'll yeah. be there. Oh, good, good. I was going to ask if you're planning on coming. So excellent. Yep, yep. excited to be there. All right. Well, I'm going to let you get back to work and I'll see you here very soon in uh, 
less than less than 50 days probably uh, by the time this airs uh, at Connect. So thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks so much, Will. I'm excited to see you meet you in person here soon. All right. All right, bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of Beyond the Scripts, presented by the Catalyst Pharmacy Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please support our channel by liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell so that you'll be notified anytime we post new content. To stay up to date with all of the latest independent pharmacy news and content, follow Pioneer RX on your preferred social media platform.